and in the house of the Lord. And even though we don't see precedent in Scripture for baptizing babies, we do see precedent in Scripture for bringing our children to the house of the Lord and dedicating them. And so today, we have Jason and Amanda and your family and Ethan. Let me see Ethan. This is Ethan. He's a pretty cool kid, huh? He's like, I'm not sure what's going on here. But uh, today we're just going to pray over Ethan. And we're going to join with this family that's part of our family. And we're going to just lift up this baby to the Lord. Amen? Would you just extend your hands up this way? Lord, we just pray right now, God. Lord, for this baby, God. And Lord, as I hold him in my hands, God, we just thank you. Lord, that your word says that he who begins a good work in us will be faithful to complete it. So Lord, today, God, we lift up Ethan Cox to you. And Lord, we give him to you and dedicate him to you, Lord God, that his life would follow you, God, that you would bless him, God. You would bless the work of his hands, God. Lord, that you would bless the gifts in his life, God. Lord, that he would grow up, Lord Jesus, knowing you, God, and he would have a sensitivity in his heart to you. And so, Lord, as a church today, we dedicate ourselves. Lord, as with this family, God, Lord, that we're going to surround Ethan with right counsel, Lord God. And Lord, we're going to give him to you and bring him, God, up through all of the years of his life, God, knowing you in faith and strength. And so, Lord, we cover him today with our grace, with your grace, Lord God. We cover him with your grace today. And, Lord, we ask that you would bless him abundantly. In Jesus' name. And we're going to pray again. But, Jason, I'm going to hand him back to you as a spiritual father and covering for your family. And uh, I'm going to invite you up here. We're just going to... I'm going to have Aaron pray and anybody else just to bless you guys and bless little Ethan here today. Father, we thank you for this family. Lord, we thank you for this blessing, Lord, that you've given Jason and Amanda. Lord God, in your knowledge and your wisdom and in your grace, you decided to give them this young life to shepherd, Lord God. Lord, we thank you for every gift that you've placed on the inside of this child. Lord, we thank you, Father God, for your design and your purpose for him, O oh God. Lord God, we thank you, Lord, for placing this family here in this house. Lord, where everything that you have placed on the inside of this young man will have a place to grow and, and have a place to flourish, Lord God. Lord God, we thank you for giving his father wisdom and grace to shepherd, Lord God, the gifts and the call that's in Ethan, oh God. Lord, we thank you for showing him, Lord, how to handle and how to speak and, Lord God, how, Lord God, to, to manage and all of those things, Lord, how to properly steward this young, awesome, amazing gift that you have given to them. Lord, thank you for giving them vision like never before. Holy Spirit, Lord God, that you, Spirit of God, are going to continue to lead and guide them and show them what to do and how to do it. And Lord, even over his mom, Lord God, thank you for giving her peace, Lord God. She's got a lot of concerns and there are a lot of things that you've stirred up on the inside of her, oh God. But Lord, even in the midst of her concerns and all of those things, Lord, you are the God of her peace. You are the God of her peace, Lord, and she's going to love him in peace. Lord, that no worry will grip her heart, Lord God, that the enemy would not torment her, Lord God, with the what-ifs and all of the things that, this, that are in this world. But Lord God, you are showing them, Father God, that he is protected, that they are protected, and that no weapon that is formed against them shall prosper. Lord, that everything that you have purposed and everything that you have designed, everything, Father, that you have already decreed will be concerning this child, concerning this family, Lord God, concerning their marriage. And so, Lord, we as a church, Lord, as we surround them and commit ourselves to them, Lord God, to love them and to 
be there, Lord God, and just walk with them, Lord God, through life. Lord, through the raising of this awesome gift, this young son, Lord, that you've given them. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Brother, it's no accident that this young man looks like you. This is your legacy. And it's no strange thing that he keeps reaching for the mic because as he grows, the Word of God is going to become his life, his way of life. And he will be a young man of great charisma. The Lord has placed that gift upon him that he will draw men unto him and he will point to Christ. This young man will carry a tremendous anointing. An anointing that will heal. An anointing that will bring families together broken families because he will have a word instant in time he will be like the son of David he will have great wisdom there will be a protection around him mama don't worry let me let me share a story before i went to iraq i had two dreams one of them was of a tiger that came a full-grown tiger came up and laid beside me the other one was of a lion that came and laid beside me i had no idea what that meant a prophetess of the lord told me that God was putting fierce protection around me and I didn't know at the time that I was headed for Iraq okay this same protection is around this young man to watch over him to protect him and to keep him safe all the days of his life because there is a great calling upon him for the last days so be at peace Rest your mind because God has it under control. Amen. Hallelujah. Good work, Chuck. Jason and Amanda, as they were praying for you, I heard the Lord say, even as in your servanthood, this has been a season of many graduations. You graduated from just watching and being faithful to, to go into the kids' ministry, and, and you've graduated up in age groups to, to minister to the youth. And I heard the Lord say that before this one begins to walk, I'm bringing you to a level of reaching the young married couples with children and those that are expecting is never before in your community. There's been a cry and a longing even, well, God, why did you bring us to that area when we're always going to be in Pensacola? And I heard the Lord say, because the work that was once meant to be was not yet completed and i'm going to start it in your generation says god and i'm using the two of you to draw together the families that long for and seek my heart and my passion and not just institution not just business as usual and church as usual but the very things jason that you've even prayed about and why you've loved missions more than staying home at time the hunger and the passion that you've seen and you've fallen in love with i heard a lord say you're going to impart that into your son right there in gulf breeze and navarre and pensacola along this entire coast you're going to see the passion come forth out of the generation that you're a part of out of your children and the children's children and there's many times you've wondered well is the missions field still going to call my name i've got so much to keep up with and i can't let amanda do it by herself i heard the lord say the grace is going to be there for the trips to prepare your heart for what ethan will be because he's going to be one that is going to seek and find many national treasures not not like 
superficial things, but he's going to point nations to the treasure they have in Christ. And the evangelistic nature on the inside of you, there's a double portion on the inside of him. That's why he's always crawling and trying to get together with others, and, and he's always uh, attached to other people, and he's always willing to look and to touch and be held. The Lord says, I've given him the heart to reach the, the heartless and to reach the wounded and the lost as never before. And Amanda, I heard the Lord say that you thought medical was your field, but I heard the Lord say that there's a doctorate coming, but not in the sense that a medical degree would come, but there's a doctorate of theology that's coming as a mama bear to protect the gift and the call on the inside of your son and the, the children that are yet to come. Because the Lord said you will be a mother with a quiver full of warriors for the kingdom, both male and female. You're going to send out Elijah's and you're sending out Deborah's. And when all is said and done, when your legacy is written and when your legacy is shared, it'll say mother to the nations, mother to the warriors that were sent out for the kingdom and for the glory and for the might of the Most High. And when you look abroad, you're going to see, much like Sarah, you're going to see the multicultural, multi-generational legacy that will be left behind with many nations touched and transformed. And the Lord will instill within you such a hunger and passion. Even in the, this week, it will be a start where it's not just going to be a normal Bible study week for you, but it's going to be a dig deeper, dig deeper, dig into the ground and the wells that you've not yet touched. I heard the Lord say, get ready to dive into the depths of the wells that even your parents and your grandparents before you prayed over you as you were a little child, saying, Lord, I know there's more than what we've already experienced. Let it be released in her. Daughter, you're going to dig deep into those wells and you're going to expand them so that Ethan and those that are going to come, both natural and spiritual, will swim in places of glory and deeper realms of the kingdom as no other in your family tree and generational tree has ever seen or heard of, says the Spirit of the Lord. Amen. Amen. I know we're taking a little time, but how many know these are important times? Amen. And I believe that God is touching your family. And both of your family, I'm telling you, when I'm talking to family, I mean extended families, people, I believe that God is coming in a new dimension for you guys. It's like a season of time and change, just like having a baby is something new it's a new time and it's a new season and i just i just see the lord's blessing just coming on you so don't expect the worst expect the best amen love you guys so much god bless you amen amen what a great opportunity to be in the house of the lord today and to see what God is doing. And I am so excited about the things that are getting, ha getting ready to happen. I'm getting uh, excited this week. Uh, I'll take my wife for the first time actually with me overseas. And we're going to be going to East Africa. Speaking to a conference of pastors from all over the East African nations. And I believe that God is going to do some amazing things. Would you guys be in prayer with us over the next few days for that? Amen. And God is doing, that's one of the things that we were doing, uh, the Zoombathon that my brother-in-law so wonderfully committed me to be a part of. And I showed up. I did not make it an hour and a half. I did not make it a half an hour, actually, even. But uh, I did come dressed to impress. If you were there, you know that uh, I brought the knee highs and the sweatbands back. So I was definitely here, but uh, my wife was leading a, a meeting for our, our, our singles group, The Edge, over there. And so they had exercise in here and a buffet in there, and I kind of fell into the buffet side of the meeting. But, um, but it was a great, uh, great time. Thank you guys for being here. And uh, for those of you who are wondering, uh, my mom, Pastor Darlene, she's actually not uh, going with us on this trip, but she's going to be heading up the next trip. Uh, that's going to be ministering there. That's one of the places that God has allowed us to work uh, for so many, so many years. We've done so many great things from orphanages, schools, water wells, churches, things that we do over there, and just to encourage and bring believers. How many know we live in a very important day and time? And so we're going to come into about the next, this week, next week, and the following weekend. We're coming into a season of time 
uh, where we're going to really hit you with a little bit of worldview stuff. And I want you to really focus today because uh, we finished the series on James 1. Uh, how many enjoyed that series on James chapter 1? Did, you, did God do something in you through that series? Amen. Well, we're going to look today, if you want to turn in your Bibles to Daniel chapter 2. And today I have a little bit more of a kind of a, a message from God for you. It's not so much as a, of, a, of a sermon per se as it is a, a message. And sometimes we bring these kind of things. And so I want you to know who you are. And I want you to know that every one of you are alive on planet Earth today for a reason. And your reason isn't just to kind of exist and work and do what you can and make as much as you can and then get old and get sick and die. How many know that there's more to purpose in life than that? And God has a purpose for you. So I want you to just, uh, just focus in with me for the next few minutes. And we're going to go to the word of the Lord. Would you just close your eyes with me one more time? Lord, we thank you, God, for what you've already done, what you're already doing. God, the healing, God, the... The things that you've spoken into the service, Lord, the dedication, Lord, of a, of, of a child, Lord, all of the wonderful things, God, that have happened already in this meeting. And I thank you that at the next few minutes of this meeting, you're going to penetrate our hearts. Lord, we don't just want to be encouraged in our mind. We want to be transformed in our hearts. God, speak past our minds into the deep places that we would understand our purpose, that we would understand who you are. Lord, we truly understand that part of our worship today is giving attention to your word. So, God, we give attention to what you're saying to us and that it would change us today by your power. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm just excited today about what is ahead for the church. And sometimes you look at the news and you see things and it doesn't look that exciting. But I'm going to show you a couple of things from God's Word. If you write down things or if you're taking notes today, I want you to write down this particular word. And the word is unprecedented. I want you to say unprecedented. God wants to bring you into an unprecedented experience with Him. In other words, He wants you to experience something you have never experienced before. What is God going to do? He's bringing us into a new season. Say this with me. Say, the secret is in the season. And Blake, I am going to change microphones here. The secret is in the season. So Daniel chapter 2, and I want you to look at verse 21. And it simply says this, And he changes the times and the seasons. He removes kings and raises up kings, and he gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. I want you to look at the first phrase of that verse. He changes the times and the seasons. Now, in doing what we do, all of the flags that are around our auditorium are not just here for decoration or so that we look international. These flags are trophies for us. All of these flags represent places in the earth that we as a church body have touched. Places where we've gone, places where we've ministered, places where that represent the nationalities of people here in our church body. And when we look at all the things that God is doing, it's exciting to see the different ways he works throughout the earth. And one of the things that you notice is different places have different climates. If you go to a place like where we're going this week to East Africa, it's right on the equator. It's a very tropical environment tropical environments in Central and South America, there are fruits and vegetables that grow there that don't grow here. One of the fruits I love in a tropical environment is mangoes. Have you ever had a really, like a really fresh mango? Not, not one like you can get here, but like, like a really fresh one, like right off. It, they're amazing. They get all in your teeth and you have to use floss and it's just wonderful. You know, it's just wonderful. But Here's the thing, they don't grow really here in the U.S. Why? Is it because our soil is different here than there? Not really. Is it because there's more rain in one place than the other? No, no. Is it because the seed works differently in different geographies of the world? No, the only thing that makes a difference is the climate. It's the atmosphere, right? What causes seasons to change? Climate 
and atmosphere. Here is the word I have for you today. All of our worship, our dedication to him, our faith is heating up the atmosphere so that God can do something he's never done before. The secret is in the season. And there are seasons of time. God is saying to us, more passion, more prayer, more surrender. Why? God wants to change the season. But if you don't have the right atmosphere, you can't sustain a season. How many know you can have a great seed, very healthy, strong seed, and you can plant it, and you can fertilize it, and you can water it, and you can take care of it, but if it's not the right season to plant the seed, it's still not going to grow. No matter what you do, the atmosphere and climate has to be right. I see many of you in this room coming into a new season in your life. Some of you didn't hear me. I said, I see many of you coming into a new season in your life. God is changing atmosphere. This is, I believe, in this time of the year. Some of you need it to happen in your homes. Some of you need to happen in other areas of your life, in different things that you've been hoping for, believing for, things that you might have given up on. And I have a word for you today. God is changing the season for you. Trust in the Lord. Have faith in God. Let him be the season for your seed. It's unprecedented. The heavens are opening, I believe. And God is doing something new and unique and sovereign with us. So when you have seed, you have to know when to sow it. A seed can be an idea, right? A seed can be an opportunity. A seed can be all kinds of things. You have to know when to sow it. Who decides when it's time to sow? It's up to the season, right? Who decides when it's time to reap? It's up to the season. And according to Daniel, he changes the times and the seasons. And we are in a change. And I believe there are unusual seasons for unusual times. You don't have to turn there. But Galatians chapter 6 and verse 9 says, Don't grow weary while doing good. Because in due season you will reap if you do not lose heart. Come on, everybody say due season. There is a due season for you. It's an unprecedented season. It's a reaping season. America, where we live and enjoy, represents about 4% of the world's population Yet this year, we have reached a new population high of 320 million people, almost. That's how big we are, 300, almost 320 million Americans just like us in this country. But you know what? That's just a drop in the bucket. And all that we see in the news and everything that we process and everything that we understand and all the culture and the things we like and don't like really exist in this 4% bubble. And when you get outside of this bubble, you see a world that represents something much bigger than we are and many times much different. But today, I'm getting more and more of a burden, not only for the nations and what God is doing and what he's calling us to do in nations, but I'm also getting more of a burden for this nation. The Lord has been speaking to me for about the past two or three months that he wants to shake this nation. And let me tell you, it is shaking. In our nation today, there are about 380,000 local churches. The median attendance of the church is about 70 people. That means half of them have less than 70, half of them have more. But the average attendance is about 70 people. So what that means is that today on Sunday, we have about 26 million people attending church out of the 320 million people in our population that's about eight percent and here's the other thing it's going down not up i heard recently from someone that the united states is now the third largest unreached nation in the world by population 
nation that has for the last century been the forerunner of missions in the gospel and the earth. We have churches everywhere, and we can kind of be comfortable in our American spirituality, imagining that we're something good, but we are still not connecting with a generation who remains unmoved, unchanged, and unimpressed by what they see, and we serve the creator of the universe. This is why I do what I do. It's why we are who we are as a church. Our young generation... A year from now, it's estimated that less than 4% of American teenagers will be born again. Less than 4% of our young generation will know Jesus. We need a revolution. We need a shaking. America needs to be shaken. But here's what God's speaking to me. He says, you won't shake this nation until you're shaken. You can't see a nation shaken until you're shaken. We need a shaking. Jubilee needs to be shaken. We think of Jubilee as being a pretty kind of on fire for God kind of a church. But I know there's a lot of people even here that are kind of so-so, right? Kind of half connected. Come if we feel like it kind of deal. Just kind of going through life existing. Listen, the days are short and the times are vital. Many unconcerned with souls, little compassion. I had to stop and consider some things. You know, if if you're here and your desire is to figure out how to leave early to get to Golden Corral ahead of everybody else, you might be in the wrong church, right? And some of you say, yeah, as long as the preacher preaches here, I am in the wrong church. No, listen, this is what God is saying to us. There's something that is more important than the routine. We may not have the influence we need to shake our nation like we would like to see it shaken, but let me tell you, we can shake something right here. And if we will let God do a shaking inside of us, he can shake a nation and the nations of the earth. So I want you to turn in your Bibles to 1 Samuel chapter 13. 1 Samuel chapter 13, and we're going to begin in verse 5, and I want to take you to this story. Now, at this time in Israel's history, Israel has just had its first king. Well, actually, Israel's first king was God. God was their king, and he would speak to people through judges and prophets and priests. And he would govern his people through their voice as their king. But the people, the Bible says, wanted to be like other nations and wanted to have a human king. Let me tell you something. People like kings. We like to have somebody in charge that says what to do and that we can hold responsible when things go wrong. We like to have kings. And so did Israel. So God gave them what they wanted. How many know sometimes the worst thing that could happen is God to give you what you want? And God gave Israel a king. His name was Saul. He was from the best tribe. He was tall. He was nice looking. He had a good family. He had everything together. But he had issues in his heart. And because of that, the nation kind of got in a mess. And the nation in that time was fighting against the Philistines. You know the story. At another time, in the same time period, a young shepherd boy by the name of David went to fight against the biggest Philistine they had, which was Goliath. The story of David and Goliath you may be familiar with. Well, this is kind of in that same time period. Saul is king. In 1 Samuel 13 and verse 5, we read what was going on. It says, Then the Philistines gathered together to fight with Israel. Now look at what the Philistines had as an army. 30,000 chariots and 6,000 horsemen. And people as the sand on the seashore in multitude. And they came up and encamped in Mishmash to the east of beth Aven. When the men of Israel saw that they were in danger, for the people were distressed, here's what the people of God did. They hid in caves, in thickets, in rocks, in holes, and in pits. And some of the Hebrews crossed over the Jordan to the land of Gad and Gilead. Some of them went across the river to the other land to escape the Philistines. As for Saul, this was the king, he was still in Gilgal. 
And all the people followed him trembling. Right? So we see that the people weren't very brave. They were not secure in this fight against the Philistines. They saw this massive army coming to squash them, basically. So they were hiding, trying to protect themselves, trying to run, trying to do this or that. And so the Philistines had gathered all their strength together and turned against Israel. And the people of Israel responded by being afraid. Why were they afraid? Because they forgot that God was with them. When you forget that God is with you, it's easy to get afraid when things turn bad. And sooner or later, things always turn bad. So the thing of the people being afraid and, and, and then Saul is going to have to go out and fight these Philistines. And so he, he's making a sacrifice to the Lord, waiting for the prophet Samuel to arrive to make the sacrifice. Samuel's running late, as do many ministers run late sometimes. And that wasn't in the Bible. I just threw that in there for my own benefit. Um, but as Samuel was running late, what happened was Saul went ahead and did the sacrifice himself, which he shouldn't have done. And it caused a huge problem, and ultimately Saul lost his kingdom over that and a couple of other issues. Now, if you look over to chapter 14, verse 1 or 2, we see what's happening in the story next. Saul had a son by the name of Jonathan. Jonathan has grown. Jonathan and David were friends. Jonathan had a warrior's heart, and he had a strong faith in God. Verse 1, now it happened one day that Jonathan, the son of Saul, said to the young man who bore his armor, Come, let us go over to the Philistines' garrison that is on the other side. But he did not tell his father. In other words, he had his own little battle plan that did not include his dad, because his dad would have stopped him. And Saul was sitting on the outskirts of Gibeah under a pomegranate tree, which is in Migron. The people who were with him were about six hundred men. Now, how many people did the Philistines have? Do you remember? 30,000 chariots, 6,000 horsemen, and people that look like the sand of the seashore. How many does Saul have with him? 600. And they're afraid, and they're sitting under a pomegranate tree. And so here's Jonathan all by himself with his armor bearer, and he makes a plan that he and his armor bearer are going to go fight the Philistines. So in the comparison, the nation of Israel was in danger and the nation of Israel was in hiding. What a picture of the church. We get into a comfort zone in a time of serious threat. And Jonathan and his armor bearer, I believe, is a picture of the young generation. How many young people do I have in here today? I believe, how many, how many think you're young, even if you're not so young, but it's okay. You're young at heart. Listen, this counts. Because Jonathan and his armor bearer are a picture of the young generation, and it's important, I believe, to understand the power and energy and vision that a young generation carries. And they don't have enough wisdom or maturity to be afraid yet. So God uses them in an amazing way. So here's what Jonathan did. He had a younger man that was his armor bearer. They acted as fellow warriors, brothers, and here's what was happening. Well, let me say this first. I believe that the fight against the devil in this generation is going to be antagonized by the young generation. Because young people have a great ability to antagonize. And if we can get their focus turned on the devil, how many know we can antagonize the kingdom of darkness? I believe there's young people ready to take on this culture. I believe we have some young people that are not just waiting around, and I want to beat the devil publicly. Younger generation is ready to go, and I believe that God is getting ready to empower them, even right here in this church specifically. So where is Saul? King Saul with his 600 is sitting under a pomegranate tree. I believe the pomegranate tree represents a place of comfort in a time of war. And we as Christians often find ourselves under the pomegranate tree just like Saul 
enjoying the juice. And every once in a while, we reach up and get another pomegranate. But our generation is being invaded. Our nation is in a difficult place. And we're satisfied with our 600. Listen, I'm looking for a season that is unprecedented. I have an expectation of a harvest like we've never seen before. And I believe if we will allow God to use each one of us in the way he's designed us for this time period, if you'll grab a hold of your purpose, if you'll kind of get out of yourself and out of maintaining, I believe God's going to push you forward into something that's going to blow your mind. And that's why the enemy fights some of you so hard. That's why he's been attacking some of you so hard in your finances, in your marriages, and other things because he doesn't want you to be who God's called you to be. But today, we're pulling back. We're uncovering the plan of the enemy. We have a world that both naturally and spiritually are showing some significant warning signs. Jesus said, before the last days get here, there will be a lot of signs that begin to happen. Signs in the sun and moon and the stars. It says, on the earth, distress of nation. Men's hearts would fe fail them for fear, looking after the things that are coming on the earth. Earthquakes in various places. All kinds of things happening. I just pulled up this morning a few things going on in the earth. Extreme weather events everywhere in the world. 160 people reported to have been killed in floods and landslides following torrential rains in Nepal, in Nepal and northern India. The Michi Michigan governor has declared parts of southeast Michigan a disaster area after widespread flooding there. Brazil's largest city, Sao Paulo, one of the largest cities in the world, is running out of water and running out of options the worst drought to hit the Sao Paulo region in 84 years. At least nine people were killed and 11 others are still missing after heavy rains lashed southwest China. Heavy rains have spawned flash floods across this country, causing so much damage and destruction that the news media doesn't have enough space on the news to report all of them. This, this is just in the last few weeks. The most severe recorded drought in all of American history in California in the West is stoking fears of a widespread water crisis there. Earthquakes, hundreds of earthquakes and tremors strike central Idaho recently. Nicaragua rocked by two earthquakes last week with a magnitude greater than 6.0. A series of earthquakes over the past few weeks continue to break Alarming records of seismic activity in Oklahoma where earthquakes don't happen. We've had almost as many magnitude three and greater earthquakes already in this year than we have for the past few years combined. 300 earthquakes rattled northern Chile earlier this year. Last year, two major earthquakes killed hundreds in Pakistan. And as I'm preparing to leave on a trip that flies us across the Atlantic to Europe and then down into Africa, I'm also having to watch a weather pattern of a volcano that's erupting again in Iceland. One of the biggest eruptions that's only being held back right now by a glacial cap that's over the top of it that they don't know how long that's going to last or what the widespread damage will be or how many airlines will not be able to fly for how long economic crisis in Europe and the worst winter Great Britain will ever see. These things are happening. This is from, from this morning. Science and technology. Things are kind of being changed and, and hidden. A few weeks ago, a scientist was fired from his job at a California State University after he discovered soft tissue on a tri triceratops fossil and then published his findings because it messes up all the records that these dinosaur fossils are 60 million years old, when if this soft tissue was right, it would have been less than 6,000 years old. But instead of researching and doing science, it's too complicated to mess up our theories, so we just fire the guy. Unexplainable mass animal deaths, as recently as last month. Ocean acidification accelerating at 10 times higher 
than ever in this planet's history. Global and city riots are happening all over the world. More division and conflict than there ever has been acting in ways as Americans that we should long be past. Things that would have embarrassed our civil rights leaders that fought so hard. The ways we respond on both sides. And let me tell you something. These are all things that are happening all around us. Things are getting so bad the United Nations is building a world police force from soldiers of many nations to deal with the coming onset that they see happening globally. An American journalist was beheaded and put as a, on, on a public video that would have spurred war 50 years ago. But it's just the way things are happening now. 20,000 Iraqi Christians today face massacre. World bankers and economists calling for a one world super currency to offset global economic disasters. Crime is rising, especially murder and rape. Sickness and disease in a time where we have more science, more research, more medicine, more understanding than we've ever had. We have more sickness and more disease and more people are dying. And we have 1,500 dead from Ebola in Western Africa, 2,600 with the virus that they know of and they're scared to death. They don't know what to do about it. And then just this week in the, in the Republic of the Congo, there was a whole new virus. They don't even know what it is that's turned up and started acting up. In Colorado, they found the bubonic plague. In Colorado, political integrity, blurred lines between right and wrong. How many know when you look at this stuff, you could walk out of here depressed? You know, thank you, Pastor Lynn, for depressing me when I came to church on this Sunday morning. You don't have to look much farther than the news or the internet. And you can see all the same things I just cut and pasted right into my notes this morning. But here's what the Bible says. He says when you look at these things, the, the, the things Christians do is we tend to do one of two things. We do what the, the Hebrews did in their day, and we tend to retract and hide or get so busy and pretend like these things really aren't happening in our world, in our bubble, hoping that it's going to kind of go away or it'll pass, or we come over here and, 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 we, and we would react in ways of trying to handle things and fix things and do things in our power that aren't, being, that aren't fixable. And here's the reality. We have to see something from a different perspective and know that God has put us in an unprecedented season. God, it didn't take God by surprise that he put you to be alive right here in this day. He planted you like a seed in this time. And this time, the Bible says that your perspective shouldn't be like everyone else's. Jesus said, when you see these things begin to come to pass, don't act like everybody else. Look up, lift up your head. Your redemption draws nigh. There's opportunities like we've never had. I believe we'll see a revival like we've never seen. Well, what if I step out and something bad happens to me? Let it happen. It's worth it. Let God do with you what you were called to do and built to do in the earth. I know this is kind of an intense message for a Sunday morning, but this is where we're at. And this is a message that God is giving to us. This is an opportunity. This is a great day. I look forward to see what God's going to do. It's exciting. This is the spirit that Jonathan had. If you look down in verse 6, Jonathan says to his armor bearer, 1 Samuel 14, 6, Come, let us go over to the garrison of these uncircumcised. I love how he put that. He says, let's go over to these uncircumcised. He says, basically, these guys have no covenant. They have no connecting point to God. They have no authority. They have no spiritual foundation. They have weapons, we have God. Let's go, let's do this thing. He says, it may be that the Lord will work for us. For nothing restrains the Lord from saving by many or by few. I wanna say this to some of you here today. Some of you feel like you don't have what it takes, you don't have enough, there's not enough people, there's not enough money or whatever. Nothing restrains the Lord from doing what he's gonna do whether you have a lot or you have a few. 
That's what Jonathan said. He said to his armor bearer, he says, hey, the two of us can handle this. Because we're really, it doesn't matter if there's one or two of us or if there's a whole crowd of us. God still can do what he's going to do if we'll just obey God. They have weapons, but they don't have God like we do. We think about conquering by, by large numbers. We think about crowds, and, and we think about the power of numbers, and there is, but you can give away free hot dogs and get a crowd. Crowds do not represent conquest. Conquest happens when something shifts, and it has to shift inside of us so it can shift in the world around us. He said, let's just, you and me, go on up and see what God will do. He doesn't need a crowd. He just needs a few. Look at verse 7. I love the response of Jonathan's armor bearer. He says to him, do all that is in your heart. Go, I'm here with you according to your heart. Jonathan, you do what God's saying for you to do, and I'm joined with you at the heart. Where you're going, I'm going. We're going to fight together, we're going to win together, or we'll die together, but I'm in it with you. I love that attitude. Can you imagine what would happen here if every believer had that kind of attitude? Wherever you're going, I'm going with you. If we're going to do this, let's do this together. If we're going to push this way, let's push this way. Come on, let's see something happen. Let's pray for people. Let's reach people. Let's love people. Let's serve people. Let's heal people. What if nothing happens? Well, what if it does? Let's push into this understanding that God can save by many or by few. Real discipleship is when I'm joined with you in our hearts, not just in an organization, not just in church meetings, but when my heart is joined to your heart. And Jonathan and his armor bearer could not get to their enemy very easily because the enemy was up a rocky side of mountains. So they had to make a decision, and here's what they did. Verse 8, this is really an amazing story. Look at this. Jonathan says, let's cross over to these men, to these Philistines, and we're going to show ourselves to them. And if they say, wait, we're coming down to you, then we're going to stand still in our place, and we're not going to make the climb up the mountain. But if they say, hey, you guys come up here, then we're going to go up because that will be a sign that God has delivered them into our hand. Here's the thing. Listen closely. We have to show ourselves to the enemy. And you want, you want to know who the enemy isn't? The enemy isn't a person. The enemy isn't a politician. The, en the enemy isn't Islam. The enemy isn't any of these things. The enemy is the devil. The devil that traps and ensnares people and destroys lives. And you and I have the weapons to stand against him. We have to show ourselves to him. We have to let the world know that we're here. We have to put our faces out there. If they say, wait, we stand still. Come on, the devil will always tell the church to just wait until people come to you. But how many know people don't just wake up one day and say, oh, I think I'll go to church today? They might, but it's unlikely. Church is always trying to figure out a way to get people to come into the church. And God is saying, I want you to go to the people. That's how the church works, right? We wait Sunday by Sunday to see who's going to come check us out. And if they say, come, we go up. Listen, you can't conquer by waiting for the world to come to you. You have to go to the world. This is the purpose that God has put on your life. You are called to make a difference, to be somebody. Listen, they have a problem. You have an answer if you know Jesus. If you don't know Jesus, I have an answer for you today. If you don't know what your purpose is, I want to pray for you today. I want to challenge to begin thinking, who can you go to this week to serve? Who can you pray for this week? Who can you love this week? Look at verse 11. So here is Jonathan and his armor bearer. They both show themselves to the garrison of the Philistines. And the Philistines say, look, the Hebrews are coming out of the holes where they've hidden. And the men of the garrison called to Jonathan and his armor bearer and said, Come up to us. We have something to show you. They were trying to intimidate him. Look, here come all the church people out of their holes where they've been hiding. 
Come up here, the enemy says. I have something to show you. Come on, the devil says. I'm about to teach you a lesson. But what, he, what the Philistines didn't know is that was the invitation that Jonathan and his armor bearer were waiting for. When they got that invitation, they knew that God was going to use them to do something amazing. How many, when you were in school, remember you, you would take your foot and draw a line in the sand? You know? Step across that line, right? Well, let me tell you, there's a line in the sand today for you. Listen, there's a line in the sand for you. Are you going to step across it? Let's go on. The rest of the verse, Jonathan says to his armor bearer, Come up after me, for the Lord has delivered them into the hand of Israel. And Jonathan climbed up on his hands and knees with his armor bearer after him. They're climbing up the rocks, and while they're climbing, they're fighting. And it says they fell before Jonathan, and as he came after him, his armor bearer killed him. The ones Jonathan missed, the armor bearer got. And that first slaughter with Jonathan and his armor bearer was about 20 men. So how many know there was a lot more than 20 Philistines? But here they are fighting, and this very first group that they encounter is about 20. And compared to so many, 20 doesn't seem like very many, but that's all it takes. And that began to move the hand of God to do something powerful. God is just looking for a few. Can you imagine what would happen if this year your life was to affect 20 other people? If you were able to destroy the works of darkness in the lives of 20 people? Could you imagine what would happen? Well, here's what happened there. In verse 15, it says there was a trembling in the camp. As they were fighting, God started shaking the earth. It says, among all the people, the garrison and the raiders also trembled, and the earth quaked, so that it was a very great trembling. The response of Jonathan and his armor bearer's willing heart to go was God saying, listen, I'm with you. Nothing stops me from doing what I'm going to do except the obedient heart of a man. And if I have one or two, if that's all we have, I will bring a shaking through one or two. This is the word the Lord gave me. James 5 says that the devils believe and they tremble. Philistines began to run, and verse 21 says, Moreover, there were Hebrews who were with the Philistines before that time. There were some Hebrews that had left the Hebrew camp and joined the Philistines. How many know that there's a shaking for people who backslide too? People who fail, people who do things that you shouldn't have done and you wish you hadn't have done? How many know that God can rescue you too? The enemy began to run. God began to affect the whole city. And all the chariots and all the horsemen and all the people that looked like the sand on the seashore ran in fear because of one man and his armor bearer that said, who knows what God might do. But we're not going to sit under a pomegranate tree eating fruit. We're going to go do something. In Acts chapter 2, when God's people came together in one mind and one accord, the Bible says they were filled with the Holy Spirit. There was shaking and 3,000 people were added to the church in one day. It began an effect that turned the world upside down in about 40 years. Affected the entire world. Even in the heaven, even in heaven itself, the Bible says that the post and the doors shake from the power of the presence of God. So where does it come from? It comes from something called grace. When Paul the Apostle was writing from prison, the very last thing he wrote before he was executed, he wrote to one of his spiritual sons, Timothy, and he said in 2 Timothy chapter 2, he said, Therefore, my son, be strong in the grace. Come on, everybody say Grace. Be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things you've heard from me among many witnesses, commit these to faithful men who are able to teach others also. What Paul knew was that if Timothy could train men who could train other men, if he could pour into the lives of somebody 
It's not the sermon on Sunday that matters. It's what each one of you do with the purpose in your life. With those two or three, some of you might be aggravated with the people around your life, the people you have to work with, the people in your house. Listen, God might have very well put you there on purpose because he wants you to bring him into that place to get, see it shaken. He wants to see you change the place where you are. It's how it happens. We could do great work if we touched thousands of people, if we had resources to go and, and, and preach to large crowds, and we saw thousands of people each year. I did a, read a statistic that said if you were able to reach 20,000 people every year for the Lord, how long would it take to impact the population of the world? 250,000 years. We don't have that long. I don't even want to imagine what I would look like after 250,000 years. So how does it happen? Jesus left us a great principle that Paul told Timothy. Jesus spent 80% of his time with 12 men, pouring into their lives, teaching them to do the same thing. Do you know if you took three people this year, if you were able to impact the lives of three people this year, and the one thing you taught them to do more than anything else is for them to impact the lives of three people just like you did. And if they then impacted three people and they did, th you know the multiplying effect of that would touch the six billion lost people in our world in less than 20 years. That's powerful. That's multiplication. So you think, well, it takes a lot, or it takes a lot of resources, or I have to have special gifts, or I have to have, have this time, or that's for somebody else to do, or I'm supposed to do this. No, you have your circle of influence. All you need is three. All you need to do is touch, touch a short, a small amount of people. The devil doesn't want you to multiply. Some of you, he's fought you so hard because he doesn't want you to be who God's called you to be. He doesn't want you to walk in your purpose. He wants you to just exist. But Jesus said this before he left the earth in Matthew 28. And we're closing with this. He said, all authority has been given to me in heaven and earth. If Jesus has all authority, how much does that leave for the devil? None. All authority, therefore, go. Because he has authority, because he's sending you, we can go. That's what we do. We purposefully pour our lives into loving people, serving people, reaching people, praying for people, encouraging people, helping people, because that's what Jesus has called us to do. And that's what impacts the world. It's the Jonathan and his armor bearer principle. Just a few can shake a nation. Just a few can change the direction of the enemy. Just a few. God is calling us into a new season. And when he calls you into a new season, he's calling you into a new dimension of faith. He's calling you into a new relationship with him. Have faith in God. Listen to God. Let God shake you up on the inside. Get out of yourself and understand that there's something bigger than you. And God has given you a great door of opportunity. And if you're here listening to me and if you're still breathing, it's not too late. It begins by getting into the relationship with God that he wants you to have. Understand that when you are in the process of God, there are things that come in your life that are meant to stretch you or push you toward an intentional result because God is working in the process. And we're moving closer and closer and closer to the threshold of the Lord's return. Yet in the midst of potential uncertainty, in the difficult times in the world, God is opening unimaginable doors for the gospel. It's powerful. And what happens next, in my opinion, will be a direct result of our obedience, our faithfulness to God's voice, 
It's happening. Dave, Wag has, Dave Wagner has shared it, what's happening in Australia. It's happening. We're, we're going to be touching multiple nations at once in the next few days in East Africa. Dave, it can happen in Scotland. A move of God could sweep across Europe. A move of God. All we have to have is a shaking. Listen, it's happening in Latin America. It's moving because there are people that are unmoved in unfathomable places, places of persecution we could never imagine. In the Middle East, in areas of the world where it's hard, yet the church continues and the light shines brighter. And we're standing at the door of an opportunity of an unprecedented season. I want you to close your eyes with me. As I speak in the big picture on this, I want to bring this down to your personal life today. God is wanting to do something inside of you today. He wants to shake you up on the inside. He wants to bring you to an understanding of who He is like you've never seen before. He wants to show you who He is today. Get your eyes off of the horizontal and look to the vertical. Cry out to God. Not just so He'll fix what's wrong, but so He'll connect with you heart to heart. So He'll show you the purpose of what He's building on the inside of you. I know this is kind of an unusual message, but God is setting us up for an unusual time today. So Lord, begin to move in this place as we bring this meeting to an end. Lord, I ask that you would move right now in people's hearts all over this sanctuary. Lord, that they would begin to feel something right now that they've, they've not felt before, something that they know that you are doing something on the inside. Begin to show them, God, that they have a doorway of opportunity. Begin to show them right now that places that are hopeless, there's still hope there. Begin to show them right now, God, that places that they feel disconnected, Lord, that you are bringing a connection to them. Do it right now, Lord. We just ask you. I'm going to invite everyone, if you would stand up to your feet for just a moment. I'm not going to hold you very long. If you don't absolutely have to go, if you'll just hang tight for just a moment. I believe God wants to do something right now. And I'm not going to make a big conversational description. I'm simply going to ask this. If there's been something that's between you and the place where God wants you to be, and you're ready to see that wall break down, if there's places that you feel like are hopeless, but somehow you see a, a little bit of hope there's something because of the purposes of God inside of you if that's you I want to pray for you and I want to invite you to do something very bold I want to invite you to slip out of your seat and come down to the front because I want us to pray for you together we're not going to embarrass you I just want to pray for you if that's you I want you to slip out of your seat today right now I know we've we've prayed for these things even earlier but if there's something right now you're like, I need to see what God's purpose is in my life. Whatever it is that's standing in the way, I want to see it broken if that's you. The second question is this. For everyone else in here, is there somebody in this room besides me that wants to see something changed in our nation? That wants to see something changed in this city? Is there somebody in this room that cares about souls? Is there somebody here that cares if we live or die, that cares what the purposes of God are in this generation? Is there somebody here who will be like Jonathan's armor bearer and say, listen, I'm in. If that's you out of your commitment behind these that are up front already, I want to invite you to come and stand. And I just want to fill the front of this auditorium up right now. And we're going to pray together. And we're going to put an exclamation point on this Sunday service together right up front. I just want you to begin to come right now. And we're going to pray in just a moment. Come on, worship team. Use me, God. Jesus. 
be used by you. Come on, just make this your prayer. I want to be used by you. Want to be used by you. Come on, just tell him, Lord, I want to be used by you. Make it your prayer. Don't look me over, waiting for it broken. I want to be used by you. Come on, Lord. Stir us up, shake us up on the inside, God. All over this sanctuary today, shake us up. I want to be used by you. Come on, Lord. Don't look me over. I'm waiting for you, bro. Come on, if you're up at the front, even if you're at your seats, I want you to do something. Just lift your hands and just open up your heart to the Lord right now. And just say, God, I'm responding to you, God. I'm here responding to you. If you're in the front today and there's something, there's been walls, there's been things that have been coming against you today, I want you to see the hand of God coming and crushing every wall, every work of the enemy today, right now. Lord God. Hopelessness is replaced with hope right now in Jesus' name. Come on, the purposes of God. Come on, this song that we were singing is your song. Don't look me over, I'm waiting for you broken. I want to be used by you. I want to be used by you. Come on, don't give up. Don't stop, don't quit. Don't back down. Climb up the rocks if you have to climb up the rocks. Come on. Lives are too important. The purposes of God is too vital today. Jesus, I want to be used by you. Come on, every man, every woman in this room right now, God, we just respond to you today, Lord Jesus, and we thank you, God, that you are taking a hold of our lives and our purpose, God. Show us our three. Show us one today, God. Show us one this week, God. Show us somebody in our house at work. Show us somebody at school, God. Lord, I just thank you for what you're doing, God. Nothing is going to stop. Nothing can stop the Lord by sa from saving by many or by few. Lord, we want to be used by you, God. By you, Lord. If you walked up to the front, here's what I want you to do right now. I want you to grab somebody's hand next to you. Just take, just find, find a hand next to you, at least one hand. Just grab somebody's hand, and I want you to lift it up right now. And we're going to pray for our nation and our generation for the next two minutes. Come on. Lord, we thank you, God, that you've called us to be a light to the nations. But, God, we pray for our nation right now, God. Lord, we pray that you would give us the right perspective, that you would bring an awakening and a shaking, God. Lord, that we would anticipate good things, God, in our city, God, in this city, in our nation, God, in this region, Lord. Lord, that you would come and touch our lives, God, and show us how to be a light, God. Lord, that you would deal with the hearts of men and leaders, God, that their lives would turn to you, that their eyes would be fixed on you, O oh God. Lord, that we would see something shaken and broken open, God. Lord, that we would see the power of the gospel released, Lord Jesus. God, that we would see another great awakening happen, Lord God, in our day. And we wouldn't back down from it today. And we thank you, Lord, that we have the greatest opportunity of any generation to see a move of God. We stand before the open door, God, and we step through it today. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Come on, just give the Lord an offering of your praise today. Hallelujah. Lord, we want to be used by you today, God. That's the power of the gospel. Two weekends from today. We have next week and the following weekend. 
We have a, two weekends from today, a powerful weekend, Friday night, Saturday morning, and then we have su- Sunday morning in our Sunday night live. Truth be told, just the, the ability to have these guys come into this area is, is almost miraculous. It's very difficult. They will blow your mind as believers showing us how we respond to the world we live in. What we do, you don't want to miss that. You don't want to miss next Sunday either. God is getting ready to do some amazing things. And it has everything to do with you. Walk in your purpose. Be blessed this week. If you need special prayer or ministry, we'll be happy to pray for you today. Otherwise, God bless you this week. And let God use you like you've never been used before. In Jesus' name.